И е такова лани, дава взор, дава. Няма в това време да дойде. Вече. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Stories from the Archives. Um, I am Tim Nutt, Director of the UAMS Historical Research Center, and uh, we're glad to have you here today. Uh, the Historical Research Center is the Archives Division of the UAMS Library, and we're located in the library on the fifth floor. And our mission is to collect and preserve the institutional record of the medical center. So all the departmental reports, things like that, that tell the story of the uh, of UAMS. And then, but then the, our second, the second part of our mission is just to preserve the history of the medical sciences or the health sciences in Arkansas. So there are some things that might not have anything to do with um, UAMS, say a doctor in Fayetteville, Northwest Arkansas that that didn't attend UAMS but still had a practice in Fayetteville. So we are interested in preserving those materials as well. Um, as I mentioned, we are located on the fifth floor of the library. We'd love to give you a tour if you're interested in interested in that uh, to show you our archival materials and the artifacts that we've collected through the years. And this uh, stories from the archives is one of the uh, pieces of programming that we put on throughout the year, and it is um, it was developed to sort of showcase our materials and the artifacts in our collection. So the stories are based around a, a archival uh, uh, materials in our collections, a correspondence or something, or it may just be based around an artifact in our collection. And so that, that's how this uh, lecture series came to be. Um, so today uh, we're going to be talking, uh, Suzanne has used uh, some of our nursing collections uh, in the preparation of this talk. If you do have a question, please use the chat feature. Uh, just type it in the uh, question and answer, uh, either the question and answer or chat. I'll be uh, monitoring those and then we will ha we have time at the end. Uh, we will answer those. And um, I'm happy to have Suzanne Easley here. Suzanne is the assistant director and archivist here in the Historical Research Center. And she is going to uh, be talking about nursing schools in Arkansas. The title of her presentation, A Modern Innovation, Nursing Schools in Arkansas, 1860 to 1960. So I'm going to turn off my camera and video and turn it over to Suzanne. Thank you, Tim. Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm going to get my presentation pulled up here. And let's see. Uh, let's see, I don't think I... Share screen. Okay, there we go. I lost the button. Okay, hey, as Tim said, this is uh, Stories from the Archives, and today I'm going to be talking about some of the early nursing schools in Arkansas, and um, the documents and the photographs that you will see in the presentation today uh, are from the uh, collections of the Historical Research Center, unless otherwise noted. Um, so in Dr. J.A. Dibble's address at the opening of the Logan Roots Hospital School for Nurses, he lauded the trained or professional nurse as a modern innovation. Prior to the 1900s, nurses gained experience primarily through apprenticeships of varying length and quality. At the time of Dr. Dibble's speech, the first formal nursing schools based in hospitals in the U.S. had been established. And these schools represented the beginning of a transition towards more formal nursing education with a specific standardized curriculum that incorporated both clinical experience and medical theory. Before the early 1900s, the sick were primarily cared for in their homes by friends and relatives. Medical treatments or surgeries took place in a local doctor's office or in the patient's home. And this illustration is from, the, from 
from one of the several 19th century home health guides from the HRC's History of Medicine book collection that family caregivers might have consulted for advice on how to deal with illness or injuries. Hospitals at that time were used primarily by the poor who had no one to take care of them or as pla places to isolate people with contagious diseases. Early hospitals in the U.S. during this time were operated as charities by government agencies and religious or social organizations. And patients in these hospitals were taken care of by nuns, former patients, or volunteers. Except for nurses educated by religious nursing orders, these caregivers were large, largely untrained and inconsistent in availability. St. Vincent Infirmary was one of 12 hospitals in Arkansas prior to 1900. The nonprofit hospital was established in Little Rock in 1888 by the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth, a Roman Catholic order of nuns. Nursing care at the 10-bed hospital was provided by five nuns, one of whom had additional training as a druggist. Emergency operations were performed on occasion, but the majority of the patients suffered from intermittent fevers caused by malaria, typhoid, or other illnesses. St. Vincent's would eventually open its own nursing school in 1906, following the completion of a new 50-bed hospital with an operating room in 1900. Florence Nightingale laid the foundation of modern professional nursing with the establishment in 1860 of the world's first secular training school at St. Thomas's Hospital in London, England. Nightingale and other advocates for professional nursing education sought to expand student scientific understanding of the care and management of patients and to foster collaboration with physicians in making decisions about that care. In their view, student education should be the primary fo focus of a nursing school rather than service to the hospital. Nightingale believed that a combination of lectures and clinical work was necessary to, quote, teach not only what is to be done, but how to do it and why such a thing is done. Her book, Notes on Nursing, became a standard text in nurse training schools internationally. The book was first published in London in 1859, followed by American editions in 1860. The HRC has a copy of the 1860 edition in its History of Medicine book collection, and conservation work on the volume shown here was funded by the UAMS College of Nursing through the History of Medicine Associates Adopt-A-Book program in 1998. Hospital-based training schools for nurses began appearing in the U.S. after the establishment in 1872 of a nursing school at the New England Hospital for Women and Children in Boston. The New England Hospital School was the first American institution to offer formal nursing education or what was then called diploma schools for nurses, including black and male students. However, this school was not based on the Nightingale model offering only a one-year course requiring 12 hours of lectures. Students were taught to take vital signs, apply bandages and give medications. However, medical bottles were labeled with numbers only so the students wouldn't know what drugs were in them. Among the graduates of the New England School were Linda Richards and Mary Mahoney. Linda Richards is believed to be the first person to receive a degree from a diploma granting nursing school in the US graduating in 1873. Mary Mahoney also graduated from the school in 1879 and was the first African-American to receive a degree from a diploma nursing school in the US. In the early 20th century, nursing schools filled a need for staffing the increasing number of for-profit medical college, colleges and affiliated hospitals where medical students gained clinical experience. Nurse training in these schools consisted of two to three years of work on hospital wards with occasional lectures on specific topics or techniques. Young unmarried female students cared for patients under the supervision of a new nurse superintendent and usually received a small stipend along with room, board, and laundry service. 
Diplomas were awarded at the end of training, which enabled nurses to register with state governments and take any required licensing exams. However, few of the early diploma schools came close to realizing Nightingale's vision for nursing education that combined theory and clinical practice. Most emphasized the student's duty to provide patient care, do domestic work on the wards, and an unquestioning adherence to tasks assigned by the hospital physicians. Despite the often harsh working and living conditions, many student nurses persevered because nursing was one of the few fields in which women could become economically self-sufficient and have opportunities for employment at administrative and supervisory levels. By 1916, there were 16 hospital-based nursing diploma schools in Arkansas offering two-year programs. And Lula Beasley is believed to be the first person to receive a diploma from a nursing school in Arkansas. Graduating from the City Charity Hospital School of Nursing in Fort Smith in July of 1897, she was the only graduate of this school. And six months after receiving her diploma, she was chosen to be the head nurse or matron of the Logan Roots Memorial Hospital in Little Rock. St. John's Hospital in Fort Smith is believed to be the first ongoing nursing school in Arkansas, graduating three stu students in 1898. Nurses at St. John's were given lectures on various topics such as fractures and dislocations, use of a stomach pump, hypodermic syringe and catheter, treatment of bed sores, burns and wounds, appropriate behavior of nurses and the care of, quote, the nervous and insane. <clears throat> St. John's was the forerunner of Sparks Hospital in Fort Smith, which graduated its last class of nursing students in 1971. And in 1917, the Sparks Nursing School was the first in the state to adopt an eight hour work, work day for students re and required at least one year of high school for admission. The first three graduates of St. John's Hospital Nursing School were Dolly Seaver, Irene Howard, and Ella Wood. In 1912, Irene Howard in the center would be elected the first president of the Arkansas State Graduate Nurses Association. The term graduate applied to nurses who graduated from hospital-based schools which awarded diplomas after the completion of two to three years of classroom instruction and clinical work. In contrast, practical nurses received only on-the-job training. Established in 1900, the Little Rock Training School for Nurses was the first nursing school in the city and was later renamed the Logan H. Roots Training School. Located in the Logan, Logan Roots Hospital, the nursing school was overseen by the medical school faculty of the University of Arkansas Medical Department who taught the classes and awarded certificates. And the medical school occupied the building to the right of the hospital shown here. Um, the U of A Medical Department, a for-profit medical school established in 1879 was the forerunner of today's University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. And this arrangement with the Logan Roots Hospital would be the first of many similar arrangements between the U of A Medical Department and nursing schools in Little Rock hospitals before 1953, including St. Vincent Infirmary, Pulaski County Hospital, Little Rock General Hospital, and Baptist Hospital. The College of Physicians and Surgeons in Little Rock established a school of nursing in April 1906 and graduated its first class in 1909. And this med medical college would later merge with the U of A Medical Department in 1911. And the first class of nurses included Annie, um, I think it's Bremeyer, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, who is believed to be the first nurse to register in Arkansas when state registration was implemented in uh, June of 1913. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to identify which one she is in this, um, in this photo.
Little Rock City or General Hospital opened in March of 1924 on 11th and McCalmont Streets. After 1939, it was renamed University Hospital in light of its use as the teaching hospital for the University of Arkansas School of Medicine. The medical school faculty operated a three-year nurse training program at the hospital, which was called the University of Arkansas School of Nursing. However, no college level classes were provided. Ruby Glover graduated from this school in 1927 and the Historical Research Center has her annotated copy of the 1927 medical yearbook in addition to her graduation program shown here. <clears throat> So these are a few of the other hospitals that I could verify operated early nursing schools for white students in Arkansas and their dates of establishment. And But this is not a comprehensive list of all the schools that operated uh, during this period. Um, nursing schools were segre segregated by race. So white students trained in hospitals for white patients and black students trained in hospitals for black patients. I did locate a few histories for some of the hospitals listed here, uh, but none provided um, in-depth information about the nursing schools for this time period. So before 1919, black women in Arkansas had to travel out of state to study at diploma granting nursing schools. As a consequence, the majority of early black nurses in the state worked as practical nurses who received only on the job training. The 58 bed J.E. Bush Memorial Hospital in Little Rock was the first in Arkansas to offer a diploma school for black nurses from 1919 to 1927. And the first three, three graduates to complete the three-year program were Irma Green, Hallie Q. A Avery, and Perla Clark. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to locate a picture of them. Um, according to a 1923 survey by the Arkansas Board of Nurse Examiners, the school provided one to two hours of class each weekday, but no actual student records were maintained. The nurses and students lived in the hospital and students were paid $5 a month for the first two years, which increased to $10 in the third year. Patients paid $5 a day for private care with half paid to the hospital and half to the student. And this practice was common at most nursing schools during this time. Under the private care arrangement, students would be assigned to a specific patient in the hospital or sent to the patient's home to provide care. The Great Southern Fraternal Hospital on Knight Street in Little Rock operated a school for black nurses from 1921 to 1927, offering a three-year diploma program. Established in 1919, the 45-bed hospital provided medical care to members of two black fraternal organizations, the United Friends of America and the Independent Order of Immaculates. Black fraternal organizations established most of the hospitals that provided health care and offered health care insurance for blacks in larger cities in the US. Excuse me. The 1923 Nursing Board survey reported that students did not get a stipend at this school but received half of any payments for private duty care or special work. Students lived in rooms adjoining the patient's rooms. The hospital did provide a uniform, but the student had to buy her own textbooks and classes were held in the hospital's operating room with a narrow plank set up for seating. The school had reported only two graduates and noted that it was difficult to attract and retain students because they weren't allowed to go out at night. And restrictions on students' personal lives seemed to play a big part in the high dropout rates in early nursing schools. Registered nurse Lena Jordan founded the Little Rock Hospital bearing her name in 1932 and served as its administrator until 1950. The 20-bed hospital offered surgical, medical, and obstetric care to African-American patients regardless of their ability to pay. Young Black women attending high school or college staffed the hospital and received a small stipend along with room and board. 
Students were awarded practical nurse certificates after completion of their clinical training at the hospital. And the HRC archives includes uh, several brochures and newspaper articles about the Jordan Hospital. And these provided uh, more images and details about this one hospital than I was able to locate for any of the other hospitals for black patients. And the images on this slide and the next are from a 1950 program for an event honoring Lena Jordan. Information in the program noted that students Moselle Hampton and Pauline Lang in the image on the left were attending Johnson Business School while training as nurses. And on the right, students Hampton and Odessa York are shown in the background observing an operation at the hospital and Lena Jordan is administering anesthesia. And the program indicated that this was a photo of an actual operation that was done at the hospital to remove a fibroid. And this image is unusual in that it is one of the few that I could find of Arkansas nurses or students, black or white, actually at work in the wards or operating rooms for this time period. Most of the photographs I was able to locate showed nurses posing in groups at the entrance or on lawns in front of hospitals or sometimes in hospital rooms posing with equipment. So I would love to hear from any of you who know of sources for or have images of early Arkansas nurses, especially those at work. The 25 bed United Friends of America Hospital in Little Rock on the left operated a diploma nursing school from 1923 to 1932. And the first graduates of the three year program were Laura Ross, Viola Davis and Anna Taylor. And according to the 1923 nursing board survey, students attended one hour of class each weekday and received a uniform $5 a month and half of the fees for any private duty work. And the four students at the time lived in one room in the hospital, which they shared with the night nurse. The Woodman of Union Fraternal Organization opened a 100-bed hospital and nurses, nurses training school in Hot Springs in 1924, and uh, it's pictured on the right. The 50-bed Royal Circle of Friends Hospital in Little Rock opened a nursing school in 1927. The hospital was operated by the Black Fraternal Organization, the Supreme Royal Circle of Friends of the World. The Mosaic Timbers of America on the right operated a 30-bed hospital and a nursing school in Little Rock from 1927 to 1931. And the hospital was located on the second floor of a two-story annex that was immediately right to the right of the temple building here, but I, I wasn't able to, find a, able to find a picture of the annex. The quality of the 30 hospital-based nursing schools that operated in Arkansas between 1897 and 1940 varied greatly. A few of the larger hospitals were able to provide qualified nurse instructors, regular lectures by staff physicians, and graded curriculum in addition to clinical practice. In most of the early schools, however, training consisted of bedside care and domestic duties with minimal classroom instruction and lectures, and senior, senior students were expected to train junior students. Nursing students typically endured 12 to 24 hour workdays, irregular instruction, strict discipline over their appearance and personal lives, and inadequate living quarters. In 1913, the newly formed Arkansas Board of Nurse Examiners established a minimum of two years training for graduate nurses which was later extended to three years training in 1920. Nursing school curriculum required by the state in the 20s and 30s focused heavily on clinical nursing procedures or practices, followed by anatomy and physiology, pharmacology, and dietetics. And the nurses shown here were actually identified in the 1907 announcement as student nurses. And Annie Braymeyer, it was one of those students, but she still wasn't identified in any of the pictures. So I'm really looking for a picture of, of her if anybody is related to her. 
So the HRC is fortunate to own a collection of transcripts from a series of oral history interviews of past presidents of the Arkansas State Nurses Association. These interviews were conducted by the University of Central Arkansas from 1969 to 1974. So I wanna share with you a few of the interviewees recollections of their training as nurses. Eva Atwood was one of the earliest nurse graduates in this group. Against her parents' wishes, she borrowed $10 from a friend and took the train from Springdale to Little Rock at age 17, where she became a student nurse at the Little Rock Sanitarium in 1907 and graduated after two years. The sanitarium had 75 beds with 10 to 12 beds per ward and offered very few surgical services and no obstetric services. Students were paid $5 a month and worked seven days a week 12 hours a day under the supervision of four graduate nurses. And each student was assigned a patient to care for and report on in class, which was held at night after the work day was done. Most of Atwood's training was spent caring for patients with malaria, typhoid, and pneumonia. She recalled that the only medications available were quinine for malaria, sulfur for scabies, and 606 powder to treat syphilis. In addition to classes on pharmacology, Atwood recalled her ethics class included instructions to stand up when the doctors arrived, to carry out the doctor's orders without question, and to not chew gum, cross your knees, or eat onions. Marjorie Falconer graduated from the St. Vincent Infirmary Nursing School in Little Rock in 1915 after three years of training. St. Vincent's was considered one of the better schools being owned and operated by a group of nuns who were graduate nurses. Falconer recalled that students worked on the hospital wards 10 to 24 hours. Work began at 7 a.m. with an hour off for lunch and one hour of classwork in the afternoon. If the student did well, they would work on the wards for private patients. Students slept in female patients' rooms at night and in the hall outside the rooms of male patients. The 1923 Nursing Board survey gave the three-year school a good report, noting that a new nurse's home with double rooms had been built. In addition, a demonstration or simulation room was being equipped and learning aids like a skeleton and a mannequin were provided. And I never saw any of the other schools that provided those kinds of educational um, items. Work shifts, work shifts had been reduced to 12 hours and the students were provided with books, uniforms, and a monthly stipend of five to ten dollars. The curriculum was specifically outlined for each year of training. Nine nuns who were registered nurses comprised the faculty supplemented by 16 physicians who gave lectures. The reviewer noted a good correlation between practical and theoretical work with final grades determined by student notebooks, written work, and final exams. The reviewer also praised the quality of the school's record keeping, which was, which was decidedly lacking at most other schools. So Barbara Belsner, was a 1925 graduate of the nursing school at Fayetteville City Hospital, a 60-bed facility with six graduate nurses on staff. She began patient care the next morning after she enrolled in school. She received no instruction and was told by the nurse that the patient would explain what she needed to do. And after two months, she was put on night duty caring for 22 typhoid patients by herself. And that really wasn't unusual. Uh, students would be left with the patients at night in, in most of these schools. During her time as a student there, the hospital had no elevator and patients who couldn't walk had to be carried up and down the stairs. The 1923 Nursing Board survey indicated this was a charity hospital which received no money from the city and the county provided a dollar a day. Students were paid $8 per month during the probation period and $15 thereafter. And there was a separate building that served as a living quarters for both nurses and students. Uh, classes were taught by six RNs on staff, and the school did have a specified curriculum for each year, but record keeping of the students' actual work was lacking in detail. 
Sue Knox attended the St. Mary's Hospital School of Nursing at Russellville from November 1923 to 1926. Students could enter school at any time during the school's three-year program, and this was fairly common in a lot of the schools. She recalled receiving all the required courses for a school in Arkansas at the time, which included ethics, medical and surgical nursing, obstetrics, gynecology, bacteriology, and dietetics, but had very little experience in pediatrics. Students worked 12 hour shifts with classes at night and were allowed two hours off each day if the hospital was not busy. And if they had the night duty, they covered the entire hospital alone. In addition to taking temperatures, sterilizing equipment and assisting in the operating room, students served meals, cleaned bathrooms and made beds. So in, in these four examples alone, you can see that the extent of training early students received depended greatly on which school they attended and the medical services provided by the hospitals. And in fact, many of the nurses interviewed for the UCA project went on to obtain supplemental training and additional professional degrees. So after graduation, most nurses became private duty nurses hired by patients to provide care in their homes or during hospital visits. And primary duty care remained the Private duty care remained the primary form of nursing duty until the 1930s. Uh, Mary Barr entered the Bell Point School of Nursing, Fort Smith, in July of 1903 at the age of 19, and she graduated in 1905 and later became the superintendent of Sparks Memorial Hospital in Fort Smith. And you'll note here uh, that her business card advertised that she was a member of the Bell Point Nurses Alumni Association and listed in the hospital's graduate nurses directory. Alumni associations provided both social and professional benefits for the graduate nurse and played an important role in the development of nursing as a profession in the state. And most of these associations maintained registries of their members for patients seeking to hire a private duty nurse. In 1912, 24 nurses from around Arkansas ga gathered in Little Rock to form the Arkansas State Graduate Nurses Association, now known as the Arkansas Nurses Association. And throughout its history, the state association has promoted professional standards for nursing education and practice through legislation, curriculum development, workplace policy recommendations, and general advocacy for the profession. In 1913, using the network of nursing school alumni associations around the state, the 105 members of the state association successfully negotiated the passage of Arkansas Nurse Practice Act 128 for state registration of graduate nurses. And this act also created the State Board of Nurse Examiners with the authority to establish accreditation standards for nursing education and schools and to administer registration exams for state licensing. And Mrs. Adlett, referred to in the document shown here, was is Irene Howard, who I previously mentioned as one of the first graduates of the St. John's Nursing School. Membership in the Arkansas State Nurses Association was not open to Black graduate nurses until December of 1949. A notice in the January 1950 issue of the American Journal of Nursing mentioned that the separate state association for black graduate nurses in Arkansas had been dissolved. Uh, I was unable to locate any promise, primary source records um, related to this association. So I would be very interested to hear from anyone with any information about this organization or any of the first black nurses who joined the Arkansas State Nurses Association. In 1951, Homer Albritton helped to organize the men's section of the Arkansas Nurses Association. He is believed to be the first male to graduate from a diploma nursing school in Arkansas. He graduated from the Leo Levi Hospital Nursing School in Hot Springs in January 1949, one of several men at the school using the GI Bill to pay for his education. 
So in the wake of the Great Depression, smaller hospitals and their nursing schools began closing, a trend that would continue into the early 1950s. And by 1956, the Arkansas Gazette reported that there were only six nursing diploma schools left in the state. The Arkansas Nurses Association, along with the Arkansas Federation of Women's Clubs and other civic organizations, played an active role in the establishment of the University of Arkansas School of Nursing at UAMS in 1952 and the development of the curriculum. The campaign began in 1946 when 6,000 club women and 1,000 nurses lobbied the Arkansas legislature and the state citizen to support a new collegiate school of nursing. By 1949, the campaign had prompted the state legislature to pass an act providing state funding for the construction of the medical center at UAMS's current location on West Markham with the teaching hospital and the establishment of a nursing school. However, the act did not provide sufficient funding for operations. So in 1951, the women's groups again marshaled support for the passage of an additional two cent cigarette tax to fund the operations of both the medical center and the nursing school. So in 1952, the University of Arkansas School of Nursing was established as the first collegiate nursing school in Arkansas, offering a four-year Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree. Daphne Doster was the acting dean for the first year, and Julia Miller served as the first dean from 1953 to 58. And in 1975, the school's name was changed to the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences College of Nursing. The 1955 school bulletin stated the chief ob objectives of the school were to teach the students, quote, to apply preventive, curative, and rehabilitative measures in both physical and mental health, and to understand total health needs, including the teaching of health in all its aspects. The student learns how to become not only an expert pr professional practitioner, but a team leader in planning and directing nursing care. So in this description, we can see the intention of the school's planners to provide its students with an education reflective of Nightingale's vision for comprehensive professional nursing education. Students in the U of A School of Nursing took 18 months of undergraduate courses at the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville and 25 months of clinical and classroom instruction at UAMS in Little Rock. The first class of 14 students entered the program at Fayetteville in September of 1953 and started the professional portion in Little Rock in June of 1955. Professional educational activities covered pharmacology, medical and surgical nursing, maternal and child care, mental and psychiatric nursing, and public health nursing. Seminars comprised the bulk of the classwork for juniors and seniors during which students discussed their various clinical assignments. And senior students were assigned to different healthcare teams in the university hospital to gain experiences, both team members and team leaders. In addition to clinical training in the university hospital in Little Rock, Student nurses participated in field work in hospitals, public health departments, physicians offices, and family homes around the state. Dur during a 10-day field trip to Washita County in May of 1957, students gave immunizations, attended a midwives class and a maternity clinic, made home visits, accompanied local sanitarians on health inspections, assisted Camden physicians in local clinics, and visited the county judge and county welfare office to learn about county health administration. The first graduating class of the U of A School of Nursing included the school's first male graduate, Keith Taylor, and his wife, Rose Marie, who is pictured next to him in this image. Keith Taylor also had the distinction of being the first male student to be admitted to the Emory University School of Nursing in Atlanta, Georgia, in 1963, where both he and his wife received their master's in nursing degrees.
Graduating classes in the next two years included the first two black graduates of the U of A School of Nursing, Helen Sutton in 1958 and Marjorie Wilkins in 1959. And both women also had the distinction of being two of the first three black undergraduates admitted to the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville in 1955. So, to conclude my presentation, I'd like to briefly mention uniforms worn by students in the UAMS College of Nursing. I'm interested in doing an exhibit on the history and evolution of nursing uniforms and hats, but I haven't been able to locate much primary source information about UAMS uniforms or examples of uniforms from other Arkansas hospitals. Um, a 1957 newspaper article mentioned that the um, UAMS uniform was designed by an unnamed nursing student who dropped out of school to get married, and she moved to New York and later designed the school uniform, uh, but I'm assuming that was in collaboration with other students and school administrators. Um, the white hat featured a red ribbon to reflect the University of Arkansas school colors of red and white. And based on my review of UAMS yearbooks, the dress style continued to be used until around 1972. So I would love to hear from any of you who might have firsthand knowledge, artifacts, or photographs related to nursing uniforms, pins, or hats, or Arkansas nursing in general. So that concludes my presentation. Um, let's see. Thank you, Suzanne. That was very interesting. Um, if anyone has a question, please use the um, uh, Q and A or chat feature of this of the of Zoom, and um, we will. Uh, Suzanne will try to will answer them. I'm sure she'll answer them. She'll give a great answer for each. And of I, I made a mistake and closed my uh, <laughs> closed my uh, slide show before I showed you the slide, but the. Uh, uh, Historical Research Center has quite a few collections of uh, material that are related to nursing at UAMS and uh, nursing in Arkansas. And um, uh, so, but we we are looking for more materials of if anyone has personal materials or from organizations, we uh, would be interested in looking at those. Um, I have a question while we're waiting to, well, here we have a question. Do you know why the numbering system, hold on, it went away. Um, do you know why the numbering system was used on bottles to prevent knowledge of contents? I'm assuming that was so that they wouldn't, the students wouldn't know, uh, they wouldn't be using the drugs because I'm, I'm imagining at that time they were possibly using things like, I don't know exactly when, cocaine and things like that were outlawed, but I'm, I'm assuming that's, um, that's why. And that information came from uh, Linda Richards actually wrote a memoir about her experience there. And that's one of the things that she said that when they were, they were told to give doses of things, they were told what number bottle to use by the doctors. Another question, was marriage a barrier to nurse training and practice? And if so, when did that stop? Um, yes, it was in the beginning. Um, the before diploma school started, uh, school or training would involve both males and married women. Uh, but when the diploma schools opened, they primarily would only admit unmarried and young females. And I think that was because the conditions were so harsh that uh, most older women, you know, would have been married and wouldn't have been able to, you know, live in the hospital or whatever. And so it, it, the way it worked out is that they were mostly young unmarried women that were uh, training in these these schools. Um, I don't really have a good feel for, um, you know, when that practice ended, but I do know that when I was looking at some of the early brochures and materials for the UAMS um, School of Nursing, uh, they did specifically um, 
say in their promotional uh, material that they felt like that the women could have it all, you know, that that shouldn't be a barrier. They were, they really wanted a married women to apply and um, um, they were really encouraging, you know, older women to, to apply. So. And uh, another question, what was the oldest hospital in Little Rock, not nursing program? You know, I'm not sure about that because I really just focused on the time period and the schools that that had. Um, it may have been the St. Vincent's. I don't know. Do you know, Tim? I, yeah, the uh, I'm Saint, not sure. St. Vincent was the, the first permanent hospital in the world. Okay. Um, the federal hospital um, <clears throat> was at the old St. John's College out by where it, uh, out by uh, MacArthur Park during the Civil War, but that was just a temporary one. And then we had a few others during the Civil War, like uh, Rock City um, here in Little Rock. And then, um, but St. Vincent's was the first one, uh, first permanent hospital in, in 1888. Suzanne, did you, what kind of, I don't, and you might not have run across this in your research, in the early days, how did they promote the, the nursing education programs to get people to apply or, or how do you, uh, what are your thoughts on? I didn't really look that? too, yeah, I didn't look too much into like the advertising. I mean, I know the advertisements that, that I showed you when I was, found those, they did, you know, say that they were looking for students. I mean, I, I, from what I could tell, you know, half the students would drop out before they finished because, you know, they just didn't want to put up with the conditions. Um, so um, I don't really know how, you know, probably through the newspaper. And then, you know, a lot of the women in the UCA project, um, they... Uh, they joined because they knew someone who was a nurse and they just liked it. Or uh, one of them mentioned that there was a tornado that came through their town and she was just really impressed with some of the nurses that helped those people. And so that was the reason that she got into it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't really know how they would have advertised. Does anyone have any other additional questions for Suzanne? Well, um, the uh, the email for the HRC or the Historical Research Center is hrc at uams.edu. So if you have a question, um, feel free to send a, an email to that address, and it'll it'll get to Suzanne. Yeah, that was that was me. Uh, it was on the last slide that I actually closed. So, <clears throat> well, thankfully, it's easy to remember. HRC <laughs> at uams.edu. <laughs> Well, thank you all for being here. Uh, the stories from the archives, we have it quarterly. Um, so this is the first quarter of 2024 and we'll be scheduling the next ones um, uh, for the rest of the year here shortly. So thank you, Suzanne, for your uh, presentation. Really appreciate it and really learned a lot. Thank you all for being here. And this has been, the presentation has been recorded and we after it's edited, it will be placed up on YouTube. And I will send everyone an email who was part of this uh, presentation today, the link to it. And so you could forward that on if you'd like. Thank you all. Y'all have a nice day and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.